Coming up on this episode of the Hockey Nuts, Steve and I get you caught up with all the news of the past week around the hockey world. The NHL playoffs are wrapping up round two and heading into round three. Steve and I will get you caught up with everything that's happened in each series. Plus, we'll also preview round three. We'll have all the details of all this, plus the minor league hockey minute, the international hockey minute, and our picks of the week coming up next. This is the Hockey Nuts Podcast, Season 2, Episode 36, recorded on Wednesday, May 9th, 2018. NHL Playoffs Round 2 Wrap-Up and Round 3 Preview. Shut up and sit down. You're going to find a hole through Vasilevsky somewhere or your season is over. Bergeron against point on the draw. Bergeron won it, but it pinballed around. There's an empty net, and that will do it! Scrambled around there as the time is ticking away. And this is happening. The Vegas Golden Knights, a team that didn't even exist a year ago. They've got the golden ticket. They're moving on to the Western Conference Final. Right off the draw, shot turned away. And Latang's able to get the puck behind the net. Ryan Dumoulin now. Pass blocked. Lech can stop that at center ice. Battle at the line. Penguins control. Past the five minute mark of the first overtime period. Chris Latang. Sidney Crosby. Knocked away. Ovechkin. Hits off ice. Kuznetsov! Kuznetsov! is over. For the first time, Ovechkin prevails over Crosby in the playoffs. And the Capitals head to the conference final for the first time in 20 years. Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 36 of the Hockey Nuts Podcast. My name is Wayne. I'm here with Steve. How's it going this week, Steve? It's going great, Wayne. Good to be with you tonight and uh, talk hockey again. We uh, we, we uh, have an off night in the NHL, but uh, no games tonight, but a uh, great night to talk about how things are progressing in the playoffs. Yeah, a couple of off nights, actually. We, we yep. No games last night either. No That's games right. tonight. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically all the uh, there, there's well, there's four series going on right now, and three of them wrapped up all one right after another. Uh, two wrapped up there a couple of nights ago, and then another one wrapped up the, the night after that, and then we've had two days off here uh, because basically everybody's waiting for yet another game seven. So we're basically sitting in this one where we were two weeks ago, where we. Uh, we're sitting there with one game left in the entire round, and we're yeah. recording a podcast. We we had the same thing happen in round one, where we recorded a podcast, and there was one game left, and that was the Bruins versus Maple Leafs in game seven. And, of course, uh, we've moved past that, and now we're sitting here in round two, where there's one game left in all of round two, and that is a, yet another game seven between the Preds and the Jets. So, yeah, it's going to be a fun game. Uh, but before we get to talking to that, we want to uh, go ahead and take things series by series like we have. So, and we're down to just four series to talk about. That's right. And the Hockey Nuts podcast can be found on major podcast search engines like Apple Podcasts and Google Play Music. Just search for the term The Hockey Nuts in whatever app you use to get podcasts. We can also be found at thehockeywriters.com on their podcast page. Thehockeywriters.com is a great place to get more stories and content about our favorite sport. We love listener involvement, and there are a few ways you can get involved with the show. You can email the show 
at feedback at thehockeynuts.com, or you can leave us a voicemail in our mailbox at 919-960-1718. You can also tweet us. I'm at Wayne Halley 9 Steve is at sball504man. Also, be sure to visit our website at thehockeynuts.com. There you can see all of our past episodes archived, and you can listen to the show through your web browser on that site. As always, links and stories that we mention in the show are available in the show notes for this episode. In addition to our website, you can also watch us record the show each week live on YouTube. We generally record on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday nights, depending on our work schedules. You can find our YouTube channel at thehockeynuts.com slash YouTube. The show is a hobby and a labor of love for us, but the production of it is not free. To help us offset the cost of producing the show, we've set up various affiliate links on our webpage at thehockeynuts.com. The affiliate links allow you to help financially support our podcast without costing you any more money out of pocket. Some of the affiliate relationships we have are with Amazon, HockeyMonkey.com, Ting.com. If you use any of these services, we'd greatly appreciate it if you use our affiliate links to those sites. Simply go to TheHockeyNuts.com and click on the appropriate advertising banner on the right. Your purchase will not cost you anything extra, and a small portion of your purchase will come back to help support the show. And we thank you very much. Now, back to the show. Of course, we're going to start out east with the Lightning and the Bruins. Yes. And this series was uh, very disappointing for me, of course, being a Bruins fan. But uh, um, can't say I was, uh, wasn't surprised at the outcome of the series. I was just a little surprised at how quickly it ended. I thought Boston would, uh, would make the series last longer than it did, especially after Game 1 where Boston came out and just dominated Tampa Bay yeah. in Game 1. Uh, won that game six to two, but after right. that, it was all Tampa Bay. Uh, not in a dominating way, because all four games that that Boston lost were close, and some of them went right down to the wire. But um, but Tampa Bay was clearly the better team. Um, you know, barring all the you know, a lot of Bruins fans are upset about the officiating. Uh, you know, game two there was a um, there was a, a headman hook on Marshan right on the hands that went on call. It was a breakaway. Could have been a game changer there. Uh, and then uh, in game, I can't never remember now, there was uh, uh, game four. McAvoy got hooked uh, by a Tampa Bay player. He went down, coughed up the puck right to Stamkos. That allowed Stamkos to tie the game. Uh, late in the third, and then of course Tampa Bay ended up winning that game in overtime. You know, all that stuff aside, you know, we can complain all we want about officiating, but bottom line is, you know, Boston allowed themselves to be in a situation where a bad call here or there would end up costing them a game, or in this case, two games. Right. If they'd have played better, and uh, you know, would have played better than they had all season, really, uh, they wouldn't have been in those situations. So right. Bottom line is you still got to play through that stuff. Bad calls are going to happen. Um, it was unfortunate in this case where it seemed to me that more bad calls went against Boston than against Tampa, but it is what it is. I know yeah. we hate that saying, but uh, bottom right. line is Tampa Bay came out and won four straight after losing the first game. Uh, game two was 4-2 Tampa Bay. Game three was 4-1 Tampa Bay. Game four was 4-3 Tampa Bay in overtime. And then game five was 3-1 uh, Tampa Bay, so... Uh, you know, Boston never won a game after that first one. And right. um, it's not all the referee's fault. There was plenty of blame to go around. And as we're finding out, too, and we always do, when when uh, series end, you start seeing uh, all the injuries. And we were talking briefly about it before we uh, hit the record button there. Uh, Boston had a number of injuries. And we'll get to those later in the show when we get to talking about injuries. But uh, probably eight to ten players were were playing with injuries on the Boston side of things, which, which can explain some of the uh, the the weaker than expected performances by certain individuals. Right, we'll put it that way. I listen. I thought game. Listen, I I really I can't comment on game three. I didn't see it, but my wife and I watched both game four and game five. Okay, um, game four really could have been won by Boston, and you got to Boston could have. I, I'm I'm coming just this short of saying should have won that game. That was a very close game, wouldn't you say, Wayne? Oh, yeah. That one hurt. Yep. Because I really think Boston had that game. Um, <coughs> I, you know, 
a missed shot here and there or whatever they need. They had their, their chances in overtime. They did. Yep. They, they really did. I, I just, they couldn't convert. And if they would have, if they would have scored in overtime, you're looking at a two, two going into game five rather than a three, one. Game, game and that makes right. it, I, you I know. just, it, the, you know, the thing that we talk about with Pittsburgh and, and first of all, I, let me, let me start this by saying I saw major improvements in the Bruins this year. Maybe yep. they should be happy. Yep. They, they had a they had a great year, not just a good year, a great year with major improvements in their play. Um, you know, they went from being, I think, a, a lower level playoff team to now contesting to get to the finals next year. I would put them as a team that really could make the finals of the conference. Well, most uh, of most of these so-called experts, all the professional hockey writers and, and reporters out there, most of them had the Bruins missing the playoffs this year. And yeah. I think and I think in our initial season preview, if we go back to season two episode, what well, you know, what, five, six, seven, when we started doing our, our season previews, I right. personally had the Bruins on the outside looking in. Yeah. If I, I had if as, I remember right. I had them as a playoff team as I recall, but I didn't have them I didn't have them making the the conference finals. I don't even know if I had them winning a round in the playoffs, but I, I know this. They played very well. They surprised me. They played better than they uh, than I thought they would. But they they had a great season. OK, those are the types of games when you lose in game four that they hurt. You're in a series against the best team in the East the whole year. They were their best team in the East. And when you lose a game like that, especially on your home ice, it it is demoralizing. Yep. But they got on the plane. They went down to Tampa on the 6th. <coughs> and I watched that game. And they played very, very hard and very, very well. They didn't – They didn't. there was no, uh, you know, hangover, so to speak, or, um, you know, woe is me type of attitude. They they were right in that game. And, and I felt like uh, the loss uh, – you know, Vasilevsky made some incredible saves in the third period. He certainly did. Yep. He 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 played unbelievable. Some of those saves, I told you, I thought there were miracles that he came up with the puck saving it. Yep. Uh, I, I'm really surprised still on a couple of those plays uh, because the Bruins really had some great chances. But if you look at that third period as a whole, Tampa Bay was able to control the neutral neutral zone, and when they had the puck in b- the Bruins' end, they were able to sustain keeping it there. Boston, it wasn't one shot, the rebound comes out, Boston gets it, goes down the ice. A lot of times they were able to keep the puck going, keep shooting it in on Boston, and they and Boston couldn't get the puck. They weren't they didn't score till the end on that uh, uh, on the empty net goal by Strawman, but they they still had that that presence in Boston's zone, which you know Boston just couldn't break out of that. Yep. And you can say what you want. I thought Tuka Rask played an incredible game too in that, in the, especially in the third period. He played very well. But you know, hats off to Boston. You know, they they had a great season. Uh, I think they should have won a couple more games against Tampa Bay than they did. I especially think they should have won Game Four. But um, regardless, uh, they didn't this time. They'll have another chance next year, I think, and they can learn from what happened yep. and really take it to Tampa Bay next year because I think you're looking at a team that's going to come back and go back into this same position again next year. The Lightning have it, have it all. Yeah, and these rivalries certainly are not going to be done. Uh, I think, yeah, there's, like you said, there's some future to the Lightning versus Bruins, uh, just like there's a future to uh, Bruins versus Toronto. I think those three teams are going to, for the next several years, have set themselves up to basically battle it out every single year. It'll be yeah. these three teams in, in the in the Atlantic Division. Um, that are going to be uh, right there in the thick of things uh, all season long. So um, agreed. So yeah, it's you know this is just chapter. Well, they have played each other before in the playoffs, but chapter one in terms of how you know in, with the the core group of these particular teams are made up anyway. Right. So um, right. so yeah, all in all, disappointed the Bruins lost. Uh, but yet, like you said, uh, Bruins did have a better than expected season. So. You know, there's that consolation, and uh, I'm excited for how uh, this team is going to be in the future. Um, yeah, you know, they, look at me, man. I'm sitting here looking at. at <laughs> yeah, I don't make going to make the playoffs. You know, we're we're in a totally different situation. Yeah. Uh, you're in a situation where you got a team that's uh, that's looking looking forward to to the year. Uh, they've got great talent on that team, and they're flourishing. Uh, so, 
you know, um, there's a lot to be thankful for if I'm a Bruins fan. I, and I'm not. But yep. if I was. For sure. Um, so, all right, let's move on to the next series. And I am still in shock over the result of this yeah. series. Yeah. You know, the whole series, the whole series I was telling, you know, people at work, uh, you know, there's there's a couple guys at work that are Penguins fans. There's another guy at work that's a Capitals fan. And, you know, I, I kept telling all <laughs> yeah. these guys, uh, you know, look, I said, you know, no matter what happens in all these games, I kept saying right from day one, Pittsburgh is going to win this series. They're going to find a way like they always do against Washington. You yeah. know, and we talked about the the head to head record in the playoffs with these two teams, how uh, it this this, you know, when these two meet in, meet in the playoffs, it is dominated by the Penguins in, in years yep. past. It's what, 10 of 11 or 9 of 10 series, yep. something like that. I mean, it's ridiculous how often Pittsburgh beats Washington when they play each other in the playoffs and let since me, let, let me throw it out to you this yeah will, this will, this will, the last time they won a playoff series was 1994 when the rangers won the stanley cup against the penguins yep. the last time washington won a playoff series against the penguins and the only time they won against the penguins yep. was in 1994 when the rangers won the stanley cup yep that's how long 24 years and it's been since 1998 that they've been to the third <laughs> round at all and that yeah. year, they didn't have to play the Penguins to get to the third round. Right. Uh, they actually ended up going to the cup final that year. But the last time they got out of the second round was 1998. But lo and behold, Washington finally pulled it off. They they, they slayed the dragon. And we will have a new Stanley Cup champion for the first time in three years. Yep. So. And, and, I, and I tell you, Wayne, they didn't just slay the, the dragon. They... They took it to Pittsburgh. Um, they really, uh, they deserved to win that series. And uh, the, and I saw an Alexander Ovechkin not not thinking about the World Championships, not focusing on uh, going to be with his brethren in Russia, uh, but you know, an uh, Alexander Ovechkin very much in tune with the fact that you know Father Time is ticking. And uh, if you want to win a Stanley Cup, you're not going to have a lot more chances, whether you go through Pittsburgh, Tampa Bay, or, you know, uh, whoever you got to play. Yep. Uh, it's time to time to perform. And, and that's 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 the guy that really stepped it up in that series. He played if, if it ended the day, he's the Conn Smythe winner. He really yeah. is. Yeah. He, he played amazing hockey. He had a tremendous series. And of course, uh, just to recap it all, uh, Washington ends up winning the series in six. Uh, game one went to Pittsburgh three to two game two Washington tied it with a four one win uh, then the series sw switched to uh, Pittsburgh and game three went to Washington four three yep. game four went to Pittsburgh three to one so coming back to Washington the series was tied two to two and then Washington won at home six to three in a rather dominating fashion Pittsburgh never really was in the game in that one yep. and then game six uh, went back to Pittsburgh and Washington uh, won that game two to one in overtime to uh, seal the series. And even in that game, I was completely convinced that Pittsburgh was going to find a way to to win that game because, you know, Washington <laughs> had what they had the one nothing lead and then Pittsburgh came back and tied it. And then yeah. and then they took the two to one uh, uh, or uh, yeah, they came back and tied it. And then it went to overtime. Yep. And when it went to overtime, I said, this is where Pittsburgh is going to rip the heart out of all Washington fans everywhere by by uh, winning this game in overtime. Then they're going to go into Washington and take game seven. Yep. You know, I was I was even up until well, right before Washington scored. I was still convinced that Pittsburgh was going to find a way to win this game, bring it to game seven and then win game seven and win the series like they always do. Yep. But then uh, Washington won won the game with the uh, was it Kuznetsov who had the uh, game winner? Kuznetsov yeah. scored on the game winner. That's right. The pass from Alexander Ovechkin. Ovechkin, and you know Ovechkin what? Steal. And you know what? It, like like you were saying how how Ovechkin really stepped up. I think yep. he stepped up big on that play in that he saw that Kuznetsov was was a couple steps behind the uh, Pittsburgh defense. And yep. let's say five, six years ago, Ovechkin would have carried the puck out of his zone and tried to make that a two-on-one. He, or he would have gone in and tried to basically do it all himself. <coughs> but right. in this case, he saw the better option. He saw that it was Kuznetsov. He got it up to him. And Kuznetsov with the uh, with the breakaway goal. Um, yeah. Showing that you know Ovechkin has finally realized that he doesn't have to do it all alone. 
that he does have plenty of talent around him and then he needs to, to learn how to use it. So, right. you know, ultimately, uh, when, when, when that puck went in, when I'm, I'm watching the game, I'm like, wait, did Washington just score? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, they, oh my god they did it <laughs> it was, it was the, the pittsburgh fans were in a state of shock yep uh they just just very few cheers uh you i know, was stunned and in, i was rooting against pittsburgh in this one <laughs> in the space if you look at that replay in the space of about 10 seconds you saw the two-time defending stanley cup champions go down on their home ice and there was nothing that could be done. So it truly was a sudden death. Yep. And, uh, you know, they got a great team, Pittsburgh. But the, the, the scuttlebutt or the talk about them is they just don't have the depth anymore. Right. And I agree with that. That's been the sentiment that you hear from the from the analysts and, and from the guys that that uh, that uh, kick this stuff back and forth each week in hockey. Uh, that Pittsburgh has lost the the. Uh, the depth that they that they had for the last several years, really, yep. um, and it showed. And that's uh, reality in a salary cap world. That's just the way it is right. now. You can't keep a good team together for that long because eventually you got to start paying these these role players, right. um, you know, what they're worth. And under the current salary cap situation, you just can't keep a team like that together. These these lower tier players that that have good seasons on Stanley Cup teams are going to uh, end up costing you. And we're going to see the same thing happen with a team like Vegas, where they're top to bottom, real deep, you know, right from the first line, right straight through the fourth line. Uh, you got a whole bunch of guys on that team that are all having career years at the same time. Yeah. And when the contracts are up, that's going to be a problem. They're not going to be able to keep all those guys. That's right. That's right. So that's that's just reality. So Pittsburgh is, is now out. So yeah. we will now have a new Stanley Cup champion. And representing the East will be either the Tampa Bay Lightning or the Washington Capitals. And which team that will be, we'll find out because they're playing each other in round three. Yeah. And that's going to be a fun series. That That is. Especially... You know, you look at how the Capitals have played this playoff season, With, and, and my opinion is that the Winnipeg Jets have just far exceeded. Uh, you, you have Vegas, of course. We've been talking about their miracle season for a long time. But if you want to talk about teams that really have uh, played be, uh, beyond expectation uh, in since the playoffs started, uh, Winnipeg definitely has, pl- has had a great playoff season, but the Washington Capitals have played tremendous and so Tampa Bay is not I don't you know I mean stranger things have happened but I don't think that's going to be a four nothing win for Tampa Bay uh they're not going to come in and sweep it Washington nope uh Alexander Ovechkin is going to have something to say about it so no and you and yeah you're going to have uh, you, you've got the obvious Ovechkin versus uh, well you could even say Kucherov is the best player on the on the lightning right now with uh Stamkos who to me I still say is is still hurt um, because yeah. he's not playing he's not as effective as as you know we would expect him to be um, so you've got you, you the all Russian matchup there with Kuznetsov and uh, Ovechkin uh, but yeah. I think ultimately what's going to decide this series is goaltending which goalie is going to perform best right. is going to win the series will it be Holtby will he continue to play in as well as he has. Or will he go back to being the Holtby that we saw towards the end of uh, the regular season where he seemed to struggle quite a bit? Yeah. Um, same thing with Vasilevsky. Towards the end of the regular season, he struggled a little bit, probably due to fatigue because he played almost 70 games. Um, right. And since then, he's been uh, pretty pretty darn good in the playoffs. So right. I, I think uh, here the goaltending matchup is probably – above all, is going to uh, probably be the one spot in in both lineups that will determine who will win this series. I agree with you 100% on that. I think that's, they couldn't have said it any better. Yep, so so yeah, that'll be an interesting series to watch. But before we get to that, obviously those two teams are sitting around waiting. We've got to go out west and talk about the other series that are going on. Right. And this next one is the one series that we are all waiting on uh, getting finished up because that one is still going, and that is the uh, Nashville Predators versus Winnipeg Jets. We are heading to a Game 7 in this series. Yep, yep, that is. And, you know, here I, here I am sitting here thinking, oh, uh, the game is in Winnipeg. It's not. No, it's in Nashville. It's, it's in Nashville. 
And yeah. so it's going to be uh, it's going to be a great game. It, it really is. Um, Winnipeg was able to pull off the miracle and beat Nashville uh, in game one. And that was quite a resounding victory. Nashville came back to, to, to win a game in Winnipeg as well. But I don't know. Winning winning two games in Nashville, not going to be easy. Yeah, and uh, I think you could make a case that these <laughs> between these two teams are probably, at this moment, the two most passionate fan bases in terms of in the arena, you know, the excitement and the noise and the just the loudness of, of the fans inside the building. Right. These two teams are head and shoulders above everybody else. Nashville fans, of course, are, are you know, crazy with the chants and the cheers and all the stuff that they do. Uh, Winnipeg with the whiteout. I mean, it's, it's it's disappointing in that one of these two teams has to be eliminated now because I think both deserve to continue. But unfortunately, one has to leave now, and we will find out tomorrow night uh, who's going to leave now. And I certainly have a date with my couch that night to yeah. watch this game. Uh, yeah. The game's at 8 o'clock on Thursday night, and that game is in Nashville, so... We'll be interested to see which country singer comes out and sings the national anthem for that one. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and we talked about a little bit before the recording of the show is if Winnipeg is to beat Nashville in Nashville, they've got to jump on the board early and quiet that crowd. Yeah. If they do that, they've got a great shot at winning the game and the series. Yeah. If Nashville comes out and takes the lead early and that crowd gets going, then, uh, Winnipeg will have a huge mountain to climb. Yep. Yeah. Oh Yeah. In that way. Yeah, it's it, it's going to be it's going to be very very tough uh, for Winnipeg uh, playing in Nashville, but they do have a powerful offense, a potent offense. Yep, they can they do. score at any time. They do, and they have a better offense than Nashville. Yep. So uh, it 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 is going to be uh, you know taking advantage of the opportunities that present itself to Winnipeg early on. If if they can get. Uh, you know, a, a goal going first, score first, get out of the first period ahead, one to nothing or two to one. They stand a very good chance. Yep. Um, and of course, Connor Hellebuck has to th- th- has to show up. You know, so um, yeah. And what you th- what do you think about the Subban guarantee? Now he's guaranteed wins before. I think he yeah. did that last year, and it came back to bite him. It didn't. You know, it didn't come to fruition. I think he guaranteed a win. Uh, I think in game six against the Penguins last year in the final, if I remember right, and yeah. Nashville ended up losing that game. Yeah. Th- this time around, he gar- he guaranteed a game six win for Nashville uh, in that one, and Nashville ended up winning that game for nothing. So to, for- yeah, that, to force that a game was seven in Winnipeg, that I gotta say that was a very impressive one by PK to win that game four to nothing in Winnipeg. Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. He doesn't look like the prognosticator that uh, that I, I that I envision. Well, uh, well, here's the thing. Well, for the second week in a row, my internet dropped out uh, here. Um, so, for those of you who love to uh, make fun of Spectrum slash Time Warner Cable, there you go. They're my <laughs> they're my internet provider, and uh, seems to be well. This time of night, it's six thirty at night, and I think what's happening is everybody in my neighborhood's getting home from work and. Everybody's turning on their Netflix at the same time, and it's just a, an incredible strain on the network, and it just drops out. And it seems to do this um, on, on a fairly regular basis now. So, <laughs> um, so yeah. But anyway, we're back. And what were we talking about? We were talking we were about finished. the Jets. Uh, uh, Jets and Preds. That's right. And Preds. That's right. So, yeah. Um, and just to recap, I hadn't gone over the games yet, um, but uh, let me pull it up here. All right. So game one went to Winnipeg four to one. Game two went to Nashville in double overtime five to four. Game three went to Winnipeg seven to four. Game four went to Nashville two to one. So we're what? Two two at this point. Yep. Uh, game five went to Winnipeg six to two, and then game six was the guarantee game for PK and uh, Nashville won that one four to nothing, and that was just an all around effort, and and that made that game the uh, Winnipeg Arena was the quietest that I've seen it all throughout the playoffs. Once yeah. Nashville jumped out to a three nothing lead, it was very quiet in that arena. Uh, everybody was pretty much sitting on their hands for the rest of the game with that one. So that forces a game seven which will be Thursday night, 8 o'clock Eastern, and uh, should be a fun game. I'm going to make sure I watch it for sure. Absolutely. 
will so, be a great game. So good. Well, let's move on to the Golden Knights and the Sharks. Yep. And that, for some reason, is not opening up on my, hang on. Golden Knights, Sharks. There we go. The link in my show notes didn't work. All right. So this one obviously is over. Golden Knights have advanced, um, continuing the Cinderella season <laughs> that they've been yeah. that they've been putting on. And this series went six. Uh, Vegas won game one, seven to nothing in a total blowout. Uh, I still can't believe that game was uh, as lopsided as it was. And then game two went to San Jose in double overtime, four to three. Uh, game three went to Vegas in overtime, four to three. And then San Jose tied the series up with a 4 nothing win against Vegas in Game 4. Game 5 went to Vegas, 5-3. to three. Game 6 also went to Vegas, 3 to nothing. So Vegas, after the 2-2 series tied, decided they were done. And they uh, they basically put away the Sharks after that. Yeah, I, uh, I don't have much to say. Although, I think that the San Jose Sharks didn't play impressively well for several games in that series um they played well in a couple games the two games they won yeah but yeah um they you know i i really think vegas was head and shoulders above them in this in this series um and and let it they they really manhandled san jose in a couple of those games and uh you know that one there is no doubt vegas is a better team than san jose at this point um, absolutely. absolutely. That, that, that was the most conclusive series, even more so than, than the, uh, Boston Tampa Bay series, which I felt, as I said, Boston had their chances in a couple of those games. Uh, uh this one, no, uh, San Jose, they made a valiant effort and won a couple. I'm, I was really surprised they won, but they did play better, uh, than, than Vegas in those games, but Vegas was resoundingly better than they were. Yeah, and one of those wins was uh, obviously the double overtime win, so those games can go either way. Um, right. And then, um, yeah, the only the only one game of the whole series that, that San Jose was far and away the better team was that game four, four nothing win against the Vegas Golden Knights. Other than that, it was a struggle for San Jose, the, yeah. the, the entire series. Uh, yep. So, yeah, Vegas is... Uh, Continues to play well. Continues to. Uh, I don't know if you if they're surprising anyone anymore. I think everyone's expecting them to play uh, as good as they are. And uh, at this point, I mean, it's you get this far into the season, this far into the playoffs, it's no longer a fluke. They are okay. they are a legit strong team. Do you think Wayne? I'm going to throw something at you. Yeah. Do you think that they are coming on in the Western Conference at the perfect time? You have the dissension of uh, the the descending aspect of the Chicago Blackhawks, uh, a team that, you know, they may show up again and get it back together next year. The Kings did this year, but you have a, a team in the Los Angeles Kings as well that uh, has maybe reached their crest and, and come down from where they were. Well, um, and the only team you really see moving, making a serious move up is uh, in the last couple of years is, is the Nashville Predators. And, and you can, you can put a, a star beside the Winnipeg Jets for a great year this year, but you know, here's a team in Vegas that's coming on uh, as these other major powerhouses that have carried the Western Conference for the last seven or eight years are are descending. And uh, they, they came on at the right time. Yeah, I would agree with that. <coughs> I would agree with that. I mean, I don't think this Vegas team would be able to beat the Stanley Cup champion uh, Chicago Blackhawks. Those are some incredible teams yep. that were way better than everybody else. Um, so, yeah, I would certainly agree with that, that the West right now is more wide open than it's ever been in the past. Um, just because you have you know teams like Chicago that have come down, L.A. who's come down, uh, and then you've got other teams that are that are coming up. Winnipeg is is playing better than they ever have before. Uh, Nashville, starting with the basically last season, uh, their playoff run, ha they're and now have established themselves as a legit powerhouse in the West. So the West is certainly wide open, and to have Vegas come along uh, is definitely um, you know they're seizing an opportunity there. Yeah, I I think that's what it is. I really do. I think. I think had you had you put them in two years previous, uh, say uh, in the 2015-16 season, I 
I don't even know if they'd make the playoffs, but they certainly wouldn't, you know, both both L.A. and Washington were, I mean, uh, Washington, L.A. Chicago. and Chicago were playing lights out. Uh, yep. Those two teams were dominating and uh, th- they're just not now. Yeah, and you can include Anaheim in that, and San Jose was just you know was yep, better Jose, yep. was better in years past too. So yeah, uh, yeah, there's definitely been kind of an equaling of of the waters out there in the West, uh, for sure. And you know, Vegas is definitely taking advantage of that. So we'll see how they can make it continue. Their next opponent will be the winner of the uh, Game Seven game, Nashville or Winnipeg. And either way, uh, I think it will be by far the toughest test yet for Vegas. No matter oh, who, yeah. the, no matter who they end up playing. Right, I agree. Because we've been saying all along that that the 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 Predators versus Jets, both teams are better than the Golden Knights and the Sharks. Yep. And we're about to find that out uh, if we're right on that. Great. So so yeah, Vegas is awaiting the winner of that Game Seven game. And the games have already been announced. Uh, round three starts Friday night, right? With the Eastern Conference uh, final between yep. Tampa and Washington. That game's Friday night. Uh, the Western Conference series will begin on Saturday night. So, so whoever wins that game seven game, they get one day rest, and then it's right back on the ice yep. for game one of the next next round on Saturday night. So. It looks to be uh, with the conference final. I'm looking at the dates real, real quick. So 11th, 12th, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yep, alternating days, pure mm-hmm. alternating days. So it'll go uh, Eastern Conference on Friday night, Western Conference on Saturday night, and then every game after that is every other night. Mm-hmm. So we will have one game a night for as long as these two series run, and then yep. and then we go into the Stanley Cup final. So we're getting down there. We're getting down to oh, it. Yeah. Yep. We're not down, far to go now. We're we're pretty much down to the final. Well, we're da- technically we're at a final five, but uh, in one game it'll be down to the final four yeah. of the NHL season. So uh, yeah, it's getting good now, and all four teams are are legit Stanley Cup contenders. So it Agreed. is it is completely wide open at this point. All five teams, I should say. All right, so that's all we have to talk about for the playoffs. So let's get into some of the stories that are going on this week. And first and foremost, we've got a couple transactions to talk about. And the first two I have are actually coach signings. And the first one has a local flair to it because Rod Brindamore was named coach of the Carolina Hurricanes on Tuesday. Don Waddell was also named Carolina's president GM that same day. Brindamore, who's 47 now, uh, an assistant development coach for Carolina since 2011 will replace Bill Peters, who resigned on April 20th and was hired as the coach of the Flames three days later. Brenda Moore was the captain of the Hurricanes when they won the Stanley Cup uh, with the Game 7 victory against the Edmonton Oilers in 2006. Uh, quote from Waddell, uh, Rod is the greatest leader in the history of this franchise and has earned the opportunity to take charge of our locker room. We spoke to a number of candidates for his position, but our conversations with staff and players consistently returned to the same person. Uh, Rod's fresh ideas, ability to motivate, and understanding of what it takes to bring a championship to Raleigh will help our young team take the next step towards competing to bring the Cup back to North Carolina. Uh, Brindamore played 20 seasons in the NHL for the Blues, Flyers, and Hurricanes. He's a two-time winner of the Selkie Trophy as the NHL's top defensive forward. Uh, an incredible face-off man, too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he retired on June 30th of 2010, yet with 1,184 points in 1,484 games. Uh, he's excited. Uh, Justin Williams said, I'm excited for Rod to have that opportunity. Uh, and, of course, Williams played with Brenda Moore on the 20, 2006 Cup-winning team. Uh, Williams continues, he's seen so much, so many coaches in his time, He's learned from them. He deserves a chance to make it his own. I've got a lot of time for Rod. He means a lot to me in my hockey career. Absolutely, I'm going to endorse him. Um, Now, it's kind of funny where they include quotes from Justin Williams in there because um, some of the the interviews that have come out since this announcement, uh, Rod Brindamore has said that he will at some point name a captain Mm -hmm. uh, of the team and it's not necessarily going to be uh, the either of the two co-captains that Carolina has had in, over the past season, right? Um, which tells me one thing, and 
that that they're going to be doing what they should have done last year, and that's name Justin Williams the captain of the Carolina Hurricanes. I think I think you're right. Number one and number two, Wayne. I could see this coming. I could see this coming because, um, and, and I think Tom Dundon was was involved in this quite quite uh, quite largely. I think you see the Hurricanes, as I've said before, and we've talked about it, picking a guy that the players like and want to play for. I mean, that's what Justin Williams basically said there. Yep. Um, they they like him. Not only that, they picked a guy that the fans in the Raleigh area, all around North Carolina, they people know Rod Brendamore. Yep. And they like him. They think he's a uh, he deserves a shot. Yep. And if he turns out to be a good coach, then they then more power to him, but they're willing to give him a chance beyond any other guy at this point right now yep. because of those facts. Uh, he's liked. Players will lay down their lay down the line for him, uh, play hard for him, listen to what he says, respect him. He will have control of that locker room, and the fans love him. Uh, so uh, that's how I see it. It's kind of like Dale Hunter when he returned to the Washington Capitals. He made the decision to leave, but there you go, a guy – who the Washington fans knew, the press knew, they loved him. Yep. Uh, he deserved a shot, and he got it. He decided to take that and go back to, to being coach of the London Knights. But, you know, he, he left on great terms. This is the same type of thing. Well, and, and here's another thing about Rod Brendamore, too. Um, it's it's basic. It's come become clear that Tom Dundon really values people that have a really strong work ethic. Right. He wants people in that organization who are going to stop at nothing to uh, succeed. Very good. As an organization, he's he's sweeping out all the people that that he feels don't have that inner drive to to succeed at the highest level. And if there's one thing that we know for certain about Rod Brendamore is the guy is a workhorse. Yeah. He's he's physically he still looks like he could get out there and play. I right. mean he his his workout uh, routine is legendary around the Carolina Hurricanes. The way he continues to work out hard like he's like he's a player, right? And he's still in great shape. He looks like he could get right out there and play, and um, and you know he's basically leading by example. And he's already come out saying that that he's not going to accept uh, mediocrity with this team. Mm -hmm. He's going to push these players to get the most out of them that those players are, are able to have. And he said he said there's a number of players in that room that are leaving effort on the table or have mm -hmm. been up until this point. And he said it's going to stop. They're either going to play hard, they're going to play for each other, and they're going to do everything that they can to succeed, or they won't be around anymore. Yeah. Plain and simple. Yeah. So, And you know, he even talked about um, that – saying that the bar has been set too low with this team for a long time, whereas the bar for the team as a whole has been set at let's just make the playoffs. Well, you know what? When you set the bar at let's make the playoffs, you're going to finish in ninth or 10th place. He's going to set the bar higher. He's going to say it's not enough to just make the playoffs. You know, we're going to set the bar at whatever it is, probably win the Stanley Cup. That, and that's essentially well, how the big teams are doing it. Like Pittsburgh, they're – goal at the start of every season is it's Stanley Cup or bust. Yep. And that's just the general sentiment around the team. It's Stanley Cup or bust. Anything yep. less is un, is unsuccessful. And that's the the attitude that that the Hurricanes need to have if they want to get to that next level. So should be interesting if he puts the talk to action, but uh I'm I'm excited to see uh if if he'll uh, he'll light a fire under these guys and and get yep. out of them because that's been my biggest frustration with this team is They'll go out and beat, you know, uh, Chicago or uh, uh, you know, a Boston or, you know, a real strong team, beat them soundly, and then the next night lay an egg against Buffalo and Ottawa. Yeah. I mean, there's no excuse for that. Yeah. Where's the effort, right? Yeah. So it'll be fun to watch. So, oh, yeah. So Canes now have a coach. They now have a GM, Don Waddell, who last was the GM of the Atlanta Thrashers, from what I understand. And – uh um, we'll see yeah. how this pair does. So now they have that in place. Now they need to build out their scouting staff and head into the draft and get ready because it's an important one. They've got the number two overall pick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Next uh, transaction is another coach hiring. Jim Montgomery was hired as coach of the Dallas Stars on Friday. Uh, the 48-year-old has coached the past five seasons at the University of Denver and won the NCAA championship in 2017 with that school. He replaces Ken Hitchcock, who retired on April 13th. 
Uh, Montgomery said he wants the Stars to push the pace and pressure opponents. For the Dallas Stars fan, if you think of an adjective that what we're going to look like is going to be relentless, Montgomery said. We're going to be a puck possession team, and we're going to try and make plays everywhere on the ice. When we don't have the puck, we're going to pressure you so you, you, we can get it back and make more plays. I think you look at the championship teams that have won in the NHL, the teams that those teams play a certain way. There's structure to their game, but there's creativity and flair to it, too. I think he's talking about Pittsburgh for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have to let the horses run. Everyone should look the same when we don't have the puck. And when we do have the puck, everyone should play to their strengths. Montgomery is the fourth coach to go directly from college to his first NHL job, joining Philadelphia Flyers coach Dave Haxtall, who came from the University of North Dakota in 2015, Bob Johnson, who went to the Calgary Flames from the University of Wisconsin in 1982, and Ned Harkness, who took over the Detroit Red Wings in 1970 after coaching Cornell. Among the NHL players who played for Montgomery are New Jersey Devils defenseman Will Butcher, Boston Bruins forward Danton Heinen, Anaheim Ducks forward Troy Terry, and Florida Panthers forward Henrik Borgstrom. Montgomery played pro hockey for 12 seasons himself, including 122 NHL games with the Blues, Canadians, Flyers, Sharks, and Stars. And, of course, I'm going to insert the little ditty that Montgomery is, of course, a University of Maine alum, which is kind of interesting because Dallas' starting goalie is none other than uh, Ben Bishop, yep. who is also a University of Maine alum. So interesting connection there. Going to be interesting to watch how this team does with uh, with him at, at the helm. He's won everywhere he's gone. Before college, he was uh, playing in the U.S. Hockey League, which is, the, which is the top junior league in the United States. And he won a couple of championships there. And then, of course, he has the national championship with Denver, which is not easy to do. In college hockey, there's over 60 teams. Um, So, you know, um, and where every player plays no more than four years, putting together a dynasty in college hockey is just not not realistic and not easy for sure. So any national championships is good in college hockey. Agreed. So it sounds like Dallas, although we know they have the talent to be a very fun team to watch. um, It sounds like he's going to have them playing almost a Vegas style game. Yeah, because that's. That what the adjectives he used to describe the type the type of team he wants to have you could use to describe uh, Vegas relentless strong pressure on the puck you know speed creativity yeah that's that's Vegas's game so looks like they're all gonna it is a copycat league after all looks like they're gonna try to beat Vegas at their own game next year <laughs> <laughs> all right last one for the week of transactions Arizona Coyotes acquired forward Marcus Kruger and a 2018 third round pick in exchange for forward Jordan Martinuk and a 2018 fourth round pick and of course uh, the um, Coyotes traded with Carolina in that trade. So interesting to see a uh, trade happening while the uh, playoffs are still going on, but it yeah. is allowed. Uh, in fact, I think in an interview, Martin Oak said he didn't even know that trades were allowed during this time of year, but they are in fact allowed. If you are a team that is not currently in the playoffs, you can make transactions with other teams who are not currently in the playoffs. Right. So Very that good. is, that is one in fact took place. Kind of a minor trade on the grand scheme of things. Kruger wa- uh, was, well, he was essentially playing for the uh, Charlotte checkers. Yep. He had been demoted down to the American hockey league and Martin Oak is, is a uh, uh, third line at best, probably a, fourth line uh, forward so not a real big um, big trade by any stretch all right let's move on to injuries and I'm gonna blow through these a little quicker than than my show notes would say they are because most of these injuries are uh, talking about players that are playing for teams that are no longer playing so you have uh, Corey Schneider uh, who will possibly miss training camp in September because he had to have surgery on May 1st to repair torn cartilage in his left hip uh, that's bad news for a goalie. Um, don't be surprised if if Kincaid gets the start at the start of the se- regular season next year while uh, Schneider is still recovering. Left wing Taylor Hall is expected to be ready for the start of training camp after he had surgery to repair torn ligaments in his left hand. Interesting thing about this story is he hurt that uh, he hurt his hand back in late December. And thinking back in, at his season, how good he was after that time yeah. period in January, February, and March, he was incredible. Yep. And to think that he was playing with a hand injury the whole time, uh, I know you don't like Jersey, but wow, 
<laughs> yeah. A healthy yeah, it's, haul. It's amazing. Imagine what a healthy haul will do. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, forward Patrick Maroon had surgery to repair a herniated disc in his back on May 2nd. Uh, he will be expected to be ready to go before the start of training camp. Uh, Boston Bruins uh, came out with a list of injuries to all their players. It's kind of like an annual rite of passage, I guess. Whenever the Bruins get eliminated, whether it be the regular season or in the playoffs, they always come out with a list of injuries that their players uh, had or or were currently playing with, uh, which could possibly explain uh, some weaker play from certain players on the team. So here's the list. David Backus, uh, Jake DeBrusque, Kevin Miller, uh, Tory Krug, uh, let's see, Patrice Bergeron, Riley Nash, Zdeno Chara, Brad Marchand, Noel Achari. All those players were playing with injuries yep. during during that Tampa Bay series. Yep. And I still say uh, Charlie McAvoy wasn't a hundred percent because he was getting stronger as the playoffs went on, which tells me when he came back into the lineup, he was nowhere near a hundred percent. Yeah. And he's just been getting better and better as the as the playoffs went on. Agreed. Oh, I agree. But he had his bout with injuries. So, and then finally, Zach Warensky could possibly miss training camp and the start of next season for Columbus after having shoulder surgery uh, on Thursday. And they're saying a full recovery for uh, Warensky, who's uh, Columbus's best defenseman. Uh, they're saying five to six months for recovery on that one. Yep. So that tells me he's going to miss the start of the year. Yeah, it was major surgery. So yeah. All right, moving on to suspensions and fines. Let's talk about Brad Marchand a little bit because, you know, <laughs> nobody's been talking about him lately. Yeah. Uh, he was put on notice by the NHL on Saturday that his actions in the second period of game four uh, against the Tampa Bay Lightnings on Friday were unacceptable and that similar behavior in the future will be dealt with by way of supplemental discipline. Uh, Marchand and Bruins general manager Don Sweeney spoke Saturday with NHL senior executive vice president Colin Campbell. Marchand this season was suspended five games for elbowing New Jersey Devils forward Marcus Johansson, <coughs> and was fined for $5,000 for cross-checking Philadelphia Flyers defenseman Andrew McDonald on April 1. He was also suspended two games at the end of last season for spearing Tampa Bay Lightning defenseman Jake Dodge and three games for clipping Ottawa Senators defenseman Mark Borowiecki uh, in 2015-16, two games for slew-footing the Rangers forward Derek Broussard in 2014-15, and five games for clipping Vancouver Canucks defenseman Sammy Salo in 2011-12. Marchand ranks fourth in the Stanley Cup playoff scores with 17 points in 11 games. He was Boston's leading scorer in the regular season with 85 points uh, with 34 goals, 51 assists. So, and obviously the the actions that we're all speaking of was the so-called licking incident. With Ryan Callahan. With Ryan Callahan. And of course, before that, there was the licking incident with Leo Komarov of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah. So I don't know where this licking thing has come from, but um, uh, Marshan has also since admitted that he he realizes he needs to stop with these antics and he's going to uh, work hard at changing his ways. <laughs> We'll we'll see if that ultimately happens. But well, you know me. I stick up for the guy. Uh, I really do. Uh, most of the time, I I see it as uh, as a smaller guy who's not going to take what people dish out to him on the ice. However, this time the Leo Komarov incident, I thought was one where he's like, I'm going to pull this guy's strings and see if I can get him to respond. But doing it this time with Ryan Callahan was just uh, I didn't I didn't follow the logic. <laughs> if he was trying to get under his skin, um, it just – it was not uh, – I, I just I, – I don't understand it. Um, I, I got to say, if, if I was talking to him, what what were you thinking there doing that? Um, you know, uh, I, I don't – I don't get that one. Uh, yep. the, the Ryan Callahan incident, take take the rest of them and throw them out. I, a lot of times I support the guy because I understand he's retaliating. Uh, he likes to get even. Maybe you say it like that. Okay, that's fine. But um, a lot of times I see it as uh, he's passionate in what he's doing because he's defending a teammate or he's defending himself against an attack that was unwarranted. Yep. Um, this time I don't see that. Uh, I see it as the aggressor going out and doing something really kind of foolish. Uh, put uh, your teams in the playoffs, um, playing for their playoff lives against a very good opponent, Tampa Bay. 
And I just felt like that was the one where I was like, I don't understand. I, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. All I'm right. Just... Enough's enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, a lot of it is gamesmanship. I get that. Um, and, you know, seeing Marshan do what he does makes me wish that we had a channel like an HBO style channel um, where, you know, you know, going in that you're going to be subjected to language that is uh, certainly not ideal for work or <laughs> or. Uh, certainly not yeah. around kids. I wish there was a channel that all the players were mic'd. You know, whatever sport you're watching, all the players are mic'd. You know, all the referees are mic'd, and and you get to hear all the chatter that's going on on the ice. If that such a channel existed, uh, Marshan would be constant because that's what he is. He's constantly talking out there, constantly trash talking the other team, and it goes on and on. And occasionally he steps over the line, and this was one of those cases. And, of course, there's no official rule in the book about licking another player. Right. Which is why the NHL really, at this point, had no leg to stand on in terms of uh, disciplining him. Right. Um, the referees on the ice couldn't do anything about it because he wasn't really doing anything. So they, you know, basically came out and, and it went to the Bruins and said, look, you guys got to get him to stop doing this stuff. It's making us look horrible. Right. And, you know... And the league used yeah. terms of you know embarrassing to the game and and you know so, you know uh, detrimental to the to the you know all the, all these terms that you hear and you know making the game look bad and so on and so on you know and I say yeah okay I agree with that but this whole thing is not the only and I'm not trying to deflect but this whole thing is not the only thing that is embarrassing and is detrimental to the game. The epidemic of diving that's been going on around the league and everybody's guilty. Every team yeah. has a player or two that's guilty of diving, including the Bruins. Um, I think that in terms of if, if the league is trying to crack down on, on embarrassing actions by players, uh, I think the diving that's going on is far more embarrassing and detrimental to the game than a guy going around sticking his tongue out everybody. Right. Agreed. So not to go off on you a know, tangent, you know, but I'm just fed up with all you, the diving that's going on. You you bring up a point, though, where, you know, maybe that is what Brad Marchand was trying to do, because the look on Ryan Callahan's face was one of disgust and anger, fury. Yeah. That that Brad Marchand would do that. And. You know, the only thing I can think is he knew he when he did it, they couldn't retaliate. There's nothing the referees could do to him. There's no penalty and there's no fine or suspension that the NHL can levy against him. Um, I bet you're going to see a rule come out, though. Oh, there'll be something. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that may be why he did it. I'll, I'll do something to you that there's nothing you can do against me. Yep. I don't know. Um, I don't know. But, but it, it, you know. It, it sure made for entertaining TV and in between periods. I, I was watching them talk about that so uh oh i'm sure they were those those and if you were watching the cbc broadcast i'm sure there was no love lost there because there's <clears> one <throat> thing that i know is is that a canadian hockey fan does not like brad marchand even though he's canadian yeah and he plays for team canada and in, in major international events hell he was on Sidney crosby's line there in the at the last uh uh uh, what was it? The World Cup of Hockey, playing for Team Canada. Um, but uh, I know Montreal fans don't like Marshan. Toronto fans certainly don't like Marshan. No, they hate. <laughs> and that's and and th with those two teams right there, that's about a quarter of all hockey fans combined. Yeah, <laughs> you take Toronto and Montreal fans, you put them in a room. Yeah. Because those two teams have such huge fan bases, uh, but they all it's they they're united in in the hatred for Marshan. So think about him at the All Star game too in Tampa Bay. They certainly don't like him down there. Either. No, they don't. They despise him. No, they Tampa don't. Bay. Yep, that uh, is true. Blowing kisses to the crowd, like yep. you know, as he came yep. out. And I keep seeing this picture popping up on social media of Marshan posing in front of a fan. A Tampa Bay fan holding up a uh, you know big sign pressed right up against the glass. He's it's obviously during warmups and uh, the big sign says exterminate the rat. And it's a cartoon picture of Marshan in his Bruins Jersey, but his head is a rat, but the rat has a big nose like Marshan has. And it's, it's kind of funny and it's exterminate the rat. So what does Marshan do? He goes over there and poses for a, for a picture with <laughs> one of the photographers who happens to be on the ice and going by Marshan goes and stands over next to the sign and smiles like, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Like he's, he's a colorful guy. Let me tell you. Yep, he is for sure. So anyway, so he's one of those players. Yeah, you love him if he's on your team. You hate him if he's uh, if he's not. And but he's a good player, and he and he and he did admit that he needs to uh, kind of tone that stuff out down and at least try to get it out of his game because when he's sitting in the penalty box, uh, the Bruins suffer for it, and he he and he's knows. A leading star. He, he yeah, and he does a lot of the stuff he, in his mind. He thinks he's helping the team by kind of mentally taking other players uh, on other teams off their game. But when he crosses the line, he knows that it's a detriment to his team, and he's got to learn that line. He's got to figure it out. Yeah, and let's hope that he. That's does. a very good point, Wayne. That's a very good point. So and he and yeah, so let's hope he does so. For, for his sake. So he'll, he'll have the summer to think about it, and then uh, we'll see what he does in the fall. All right, Washington Capitals forward Tom Wilson was suspended for three games for an illegal check to the head of Pittsburgh Penguins forward Zach Aston Reese during game three of the uh, team's second round series in Pittsburgh on Tuesday. The NHL's Department of Player Safety announced on Wednesday, and this was last Wednesday, not tonight. Uh, and, of course, this announcement came out after we recorded our podcast because we did talk about this incident on last week's podcast, so there's no need to go into detail about it. We all know what happened, but um, ultimately it came out that the league decided to suspend him for three games, which ended up being the last three games of this series, so he'll be back for game one yeah. against uh, Tampa Bay. All right, as far as other interesting stories, and this one here, um, there's really not much to mention other than the fact that it's an example of how much of a zoo the Toronto media can be. Even though the team's knocked out, even though the, all the players have pretty much gone their separate ways, gone back to their wherever they hang out in the summertime, the story came out that Mike Babcock is planning a visit to Austin Matthews at his home state of Arizona. Uh, the Leafs uh, coach and the 20-year-old center each denied there were problems between uh, two, the two after Toronto was eliminated by the Bruins in Game 7 uh, of the first round on April 25th, uh, Elliot Friedman reported that it is an effort to clear the air and address any problems they may have. So where the smoke, this fire, as far as I'm concerned. So it looks like Babcock and Matt and Matthews are not getting along. Yeah. And we've seen this before with Babcock um, where um, I, I know there's one podcast I listen to and you've li listened to him too in the past spit and chicklets. Right. There's uh, one of the announcers on the spit chicklets is a former NHL player. And, uh, He's been very vocal in in that how there are a lot of players out there who do not like Babcock, don't like his style yep. of coaching, um, don't agree with his philosophies, and the fact that he is ex as successful as he is is that he's always aligned himself with really really good teams. Right. He's never taken over a bad roster. Um, and uh, I don't know. There's not not a whole lot here other than the fact that. Uh, it seems to be that Matthews and Babcock uh, have some stuff they need to work out. But the fact that this happened in Toronto tells me, um, you know, any other team these two yeah. are playing on, we probably don't even know. Right. But the Toronto media is such a zoo, such yeah. a circus. Montreal yeah. is the same way that uh, there are no secrets. <laughs> secrets eventually get out in those two cities. So he's going to Arizona to leave that zoo. Possibly, yeah. But you know, if if the Toronto media finds out when and where uh, Babcock is going, there's going to be a, a, a small contingent of them f following him. Sure. So they ought to they ought to plan a meeting in the in the, the Grand Canyon somewhere, <laughs> so nobody can follow them. Yeah. Yeah. Take a couple burrows down the side of the Canyon Mountain into the Canyon, the basin of the Canyon, and have their meeting there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so yeah. All right. And this one's a bit of a sad note. Bill Torrey, the architect of the New York Islanders dynasty in the early 80s and member of the Hockey Hall of Fame, died on Wednesday. He was 83 years old. Uh, I don't remember Torrey that much because he was um, running the Islanders when I was real young. This is the very early days. This is when the Islanders won their four Stanley Cups. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was basically the architect behind that team. Mm -hmm. So, of course, that, that team is known for winning 19 straight 
playoff series, which still is the record today. That's that's uh, yeah, that's four Stanley Cups, and then in the fifth year, you're going to the Stanley Cup final before losing. Yep. So that's how far back that castle goes. All right. That is all I have for uh, other stories for this week. Yep. And um, I didn't have any honors or milestones either. Right. So if, really? you, if you've got any other stories to add, feel free. I, I don't have any, Wayne. Uh, and there really were no honors and my milestones that I'm aware of. Um, no, all the know. award nominees were all announced last week. So. Yep. Everything everything was. It was, it was finalized last week, and there really hasn't been any – uh, milestones that I'm aware of in the in the few number of games since our last podcast. Yep. Okay. So that leads us to the power ranking. Power rankings are real short and sweet this week too, Wayne. Well, they're getting shorter every week. There's fewer and fewer it, teams playing. <laughs> we're down to five teams. So we're down to five teams. I have nine on my list because just a couple nights ago there were seven teams. Yep. And, and so I nights, did. Uh, yeah, and a couple nights before that, there were eight. So. Yep. Yeah. I did. I did nine teams, Wayne, and I kept my honorable mention this week. All right. I kept my honorable mention of number nine, the Toronto Maple Leafs, the best team in the uh, first round that did not make it through to the second round. That's the Toronto Maple Leafs. Okay. Agreed. Number eight, the San Jose Sharks. Mm -hmm. Number seven is the Boston Bruins. Okay. Number six, Pittsburgh Penguins. Okay. Right now, I have it as number five, the Nashville Predators. Fair enough. Because when I wrote these out, they were down three to two. Yep. Number four, the Washington Capitals. Number three, the Tampa Bay Lightning. Number two, the Vegas Golden Knights. And I, when I wrote this out two nights ago, the Winnipeg Jets were up three games to two, getting ready to play a game on home ice. And I figured, well, they're... They're probably going to win. I think they're going through to the Western Conference Finals. Now, that might not happen, Yeah. but I'm willing to stick my neck out on the line and go with them another night and see if they can pull that game out in Nashville. Yep. Yeah, I honestly uh, don't have um, preference on those two teams for tomorrow night's game. Um, I want to see both teams go succeed. I'd like to see Nashville win a cup for their fans because their fans have been so loyal. I'd also like to see Winnipeg win a cup for their fans because, you know, their their fans are just nuts for their team. And they've ne going back even to the old Winnipeg Jets, yep. they've, they've never experienced uh, a Stanley Cup. And they've always been buried behind great teams in, in Edmonton, Calgary, and L.A. Yep. When they were Green. playing in the old uh, the old uh, Smite division. So, um, so yeah, I, I want to see both teams succeed. So I'm just going to enjoy tomorrow night's game and may the best team win. And you know, I'll I'll continue rooting for whatever team advances in that Agreed. series. So, all right, I don't have any arguments with that power ranking. Uh, I guess if if uh, if Nashville wins, of course I'm wrong about it. I put Nashville though. I still I still I'd move Winnipeg to number five. Yep. And put Nashville at four. I wouldn't put the I'd, I'd move Vegas up to one, Tampa Bay to two, Washington to three, and have the Nashville Predators at number four, followed by Vegas as an honorable mention. That's sure. how I do. It. Sure. Yep. <coughs> all right. So now we're already on to the minor league hockey minute. Yes, sir. And I'm going to continue the theme that I've been doing with mine over the past few weeks in that I want to touch on a couple of leagues or a couple of divisions that are going on. Uh, of course, I've been putting some time into the under 18 world championships, but that has since ended. That ended uh, a week or so ago. Uh, but the internationally, the world championships are going on this week. Mm -hmm. uh, I, actually, they're going on basically through the 20th of May. So, uh, in fact, there's already been an announcement that a couple of uh, players, uh, a bunch of players that just got eliminated in the second round in the NHL playoffs are actually going to join their teams, their respective countries over there in, uh, in Denmark. So... Uh, two of which are David Krejci and uh, David Pasternak are going to join the Czech Republic team. So, but here we are in the world championships and trying to pull up the standings real quick here. No, not there. All right. And we have two groups going on in that tournament. And as of right now, all teams have either played three or four games. I believe they will play seven games apiece before they move on to the elimination rounds where they'll play each team in their group. Group A uh, includes Sweden, Russia, Switzerland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, France, Austria, and Belarus. Group B includes Finland, USA, Canada, Latvia, Denver, uh, Denver, Denmark, <laughs> who's the host country, Germany, Norway, and Korea. Uh, as of right now, uh, in Group A, Sweden is in first place with uh, four wins in four games. 
Russia is in second with a 3 and 0 record. Uh interesting to note with these two teams uh are definitely dominating this group A. Sweden in their four games have scored 19 goals, have allowed two. Yeah. Russia yeah. in their three games has scored 20 goals and have allowed none. Yeah. Now, I don't have the game by game listing in front of me. It's possible Russia might have already played France, Austria and Belarus, <laughs> you know, where we would expect them to win in dominating fashion. But um, but right now, those two teams are running away with Group A. And I believe the top, I could be wrong, the top four advance onto the uh, quarterfinal. Yeah, I think it is the quarterfinals. Yeah, so the top four in each pool will advance out of eight. Single elimination. Yep. Now in Group B, Finland has been dominating in Group B, but they got their first loss today, uh, and they lost to the host team, uh, Denmark, which was kind of surprising. Um, but Finland is now three and one sitting at the top of group B they've scored 25 goals and have five against USA is in second in group B with a uh, three and0 record they've only played three games but one of those games is in overtime whereas Finland's three wins were all in regulation um, and then in third place is Canada. Uh, with a uh, two zero and one record, and fourth place right now is Latvia, mm-hmm. which is uh, a little bit surprising. Mm-hmm. So pretty much things going as expected right now, uh, and pool play continues into next week. And uh, had a pop up here. All right, pool play is continuing, and then as we get down to it, we'll have uh, we'll have a quarterfinal, semifinal. And then a final all sing elimination. Of course, you have a bronze medal game as well. So, and I'm hoping the NHL Network picks up some of these games. I haven't looked at the TV schedule, but um, because the countries of Sweden, Russia, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Finland, USA, Canada, uh, and to some extent Germany uh, all feature lots and lots of NHL players on their rosters. Mm-hmm. So it's basically everybody who is outside the uh, NHL uh, playoffs are eligible to send players over there. So, mm-hmm. And with only four teams left playing or five teams at, at this moment, um, there's lots of really good players playing over there. Oh, yeah. Just to give you an example, and I'll pull it up here, playing for Team USA. Keith Kincaid is in net. We all know his name. Scott Darling is a backup. Carolina's goalie. Doubt he'll play a game over there. Um Let's see. Leading scores for Team USA: Johnny Goudreau with three points, uh, Chris Kreider with four, uh, Patrick Kane with five, Cam Atkinson with four. Some good players on Team USA. Mm-hmm. For Team Canada, you have players like um, Aaron Ekblad playing defense. He's got four points. Josh Bailey with four points. Matt Barzel with six. Pierre uh, Luc Dubois with four, Tyson Yost with four, uh, Connor McDavid with seven points, Ryan Nugent Hopkins with three, Ryan O'Reilly with three. So you got a lot of really good players there as well. Goalkeepers mm-hmm. for Canada, Curtis McElhaney and Darcy Kemper. These are all familiar names to those of us uh, hockey fans out there. And, of course, um, let's see. Pull up Russia's roster. Let's see who's on their roster. There's a lot of KHL names on their roster, but it's a mix. Uh, let's see here. All right. Um, Pavel Dasuk. We know that name. Nikita Zaitsev. Mm -hmm. Uh, Artem Anisimov. Um, Pavel Buchnevich. I know you know that name. Mm -hmm. Um, Evgeny Dadanov. Nikita Nesterov. I don't see our guy, uh, KHL, uh, what's his name? Mosyakin. Sergei Mosyakin. Yeah. I don't see his name. Is he not playing over there? Uh, I, you know what? I haven't kept tabs on it. He may just say, "Hey, look, I, it, I want the, the time off to be with my family." Yeah. Or as Putin stepped in and decided that only, only uh, his SKA St. Petersburg players get to play over there, because <laughs> yeah. there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven players from SKA St. Petersburg on the roster. Igor Shesjorkin, yep. the goalie, yep. SKA. Yep. A New York Rangers prospect, but the chances of him coming to play for New York when he's with SKA are slim. Yep. Yep. But it's uh, it's probably two-thirds KHL players, one-third uh, NHL players for the Team Russia. So anyway, so yeah, if you could catch some of those games on TV, definitely do so because it's it's fun hockey to watch. I know they've shown highlights on NHL Network if you do have that. 
Um, so that is also uh, something that is available. All right. And the other thing I've been talking about in my minor league hockey minute is the American Hockey League playoffs. Mm -hmm. And let's get you caught up on what's been going on over there. We're in the second round in the AHL playoffs. And right now, the Lehigh Valley Phantoms are leading their series with the Charlotte Checkers, two games to one. Oh, why does that keep going away? All right. Toronto Marlies are leading their series against... Actually, they won their series. It's over already. Uh, Toronto Marlies yeah. beat the Syracuse Crunch four games to none, a four-game sweep. Uh, Manitoba Moose are get down two games to none against the Rockford Ice Hogs. And the Tucson Roadrunners are down two games to one against the Texas Stars. So... That's where we stand in the American Hockey League playoffs. So, and obviously the team that we're most interested in is the, our local Charlotte Checkers. We've been to two of their games already this year, and I continue yeah. to get text messages from their ticket staff <laughs> to, yeah. trying to sell me tickets for playoff games. I'd love to go, but I just haven't had time. <laughs> yes, it would be fun to go down, but it's it's a difficult time for me as well. Yep. So, um, so anyway, yeah. but we are watching from afar. But, yes. Uh, and, and I keep saying – as well as Nedeljkovic is playing down there in Charlotte. It's time to give him a shot up in Carolina. Give him a legitimate, at, Long, least, a, at least a backup yep. spot where he plays 20, 25 games in a season. Mm -hmm. Give him a legitimate shot to see what he can do at the NHL level. Agreed. So, All right, what is your minor league hockey minute? My minor league hockey minute, Wayne, deals with an article I pulled off the ECHL website. And if any of you listeners are out there this week and you actually went on the ECHL, there is a quite, rather lengthy article, which I uh, kind of uh, paraphrased. I did not uh, put the whole article in here, but it's very interesting. It's entitled, A Superhero-Sized Jersey Collection Continues to Grow. This is a story about a gentleman named Tom Altman who has a, a changed, converted the basement in his house in Littleton, Colorado. The article goes like this. Take a trip to the basement of Tom Altman's Littleton, Colorado home, and you might think for a second that you've been transformed, transferred to the Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto. The walls of the basement painted to look like dasher boards at an arena. A tribute to the sport appears in every inch of space the eye can see. Skates, pucks, sign, uh, signage, and over 100 jerseys, that number increasing by the week. Featured prominently in Altman's collection are eight different sweaters from the ECHL's league-wide program, and I think we reported this on the program, with Marvel Comics. The first-of-its-kind program announced in October of 2017 from Frame Comic Book sto Store, Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash, <laughs> allowed each ECHL team to host a Marvel superhero game during the 2017 18 regular season and the right to wear specialty jerseys featuring select Marvel characters for Altman for Altman the for Altman's the announcement of the partnership between the two brands was an exciting one as he knew it would provide an opportunity for him to add to his already sizable collection though a self-described rink rat now Altman's Alt, Altman's didn't have the affinity he does now for the sport that influenced his basement design. So I didn't get into hockey until 1994-1995 when we had the Denver Grizzlies, the IHL tickets, three or four rows off the ice. They had two seats back-to-back, -back and he could not give those tickets away. Nobody knew anything about hockey, so we ended up going to a bunch of hockey games, and that ended up, and that ended up getting me going for hockey. Being a fan of the game, I really wanted my son to play. Though Almonds didn't grow up on skates himself, his son Jake, now 16, took the sport up at a young age, when fur which further cemented his father's interest in the sport. While Jake learned the fundamentals on the ice, his dad quickly discovered something any hockey player, fan, or collector would know. A hockey jersey is so much more than just the necessary part of the sports uniform. It's a statement, a memory, and in some instances, a connection to someone else. So the man who never laced up the skates himself quickly became an avid collector of game-worn jerseys from all levels of the sport. Everyone in my household is a big Marvel Comics fan. Myself and my girlfriend are comic book fans, Altman stated, noting that he attends nearly every Marvel movie in the theaters. So as the jerseys featuring various Marvel characters were released throughout the 2017-18 season, 
by ECHL teams, Altman's couldn't help himself. He was especially thrilled to see the Hulk in the group of characters used by the ECHL, ECHL teams for these specialty jerseys. As the Marvel superhero ECHL ECHL games took place at various times of the season, Altman strategically monitored them, knowing his collection wouldn't be complete without securing several of the game-worn superhero jerseys. I've bid on at least 10 or 11. I've been trying to get one of every style. There's just really, they're just really neat jerseys, really different stuff. I was actually planning on wearing one of them to the Infinity Wars when that, <laughs> when that comes out. I've got eight of them in every style ex uh, except for two. I've got two Captain Americas, two Hulks, two Iron Mans, and two Thors. Over a hundred jerseys and increasing could take up a significant amount of closet or basement space for anyone. So Altman's mark, uh, for, so, Al, so Altman's um, makes super, makes sure his jerseys uh, never collect too much dust. I literally started wearing a different jersey to every practice his son Jake goes to, every game. This year, he was actually playing on three different teams, a varsity, a JV, and a club team, so I was switching up jerseys all the time. It's kind of an icebreaker, you know? People see something cool and something they've never seen before, so they start up a conversation with you. But with a jersey collection that's constantly growing, how do you narrow down a favorite? Altman's briefly had to take a second and think of his. I have a jersey from my son's season two years ago. It was his first year being an assistant captain, and my mom sewed his A on his chest. So that's probably my big one. Dads, the original superheroes. And that is my minor league hockey minute. And now I was able to find that article, and I pulled it up, and wow, that is quite a collection. He does have a large collection of jerseys, and there's a picture there that kind of shows his basement there from a, a pretty good, you get a kind of a feel for what he's done. And it looks like uh, most of those jerseys are minor league jerseys, too. Yeah, most of his collection is is from the ECHL, I believe. Yeah. So, um, and I guess it really took shape once he uh, started collecting Marvel Comics jerseys. Yeah, and the picture shows that he has, an, uh, and you know what, I, I I see that, and I'm like, you know what, I'd like to do my room like that, my office, make it look like dashboard. So the bottom the bottom half, so he's got a chair rail going through the middle of the room, which would be the. You know, it's painted red as the top, you know, the top of, of the most dasher boards and most rinks. Of course, every rink does things a little bit different. And then the bottom is yellow, and then you go, you got the white as the as the boards. Um, and then above that is uh, the, the wall is painted blue, and he's got framed jerseys. He's got framed tickets and sports mailing barely all over the wall, and then hanging from uh, a beam that appears to be going right through the middle of the basement is just a bunch of clothes hangers with a whole bunch of jerseys on them. So yeah, um, so yeah, it's quite a quite a deal. Quite a collection and and really, really not an NHL collection. Nope. Uh, uh, most of what he has is minor league uh, teams, and a lot of them deal with the the, the teams right there in the, in the Colorado area. So yep. he's very much. Uh, I see a Charlotte a Checkers guy. jersey there. Yeah, there is one. There's a Checkers jersey on his wall. Yep. Or Hurricanes. Uh, I, well, I it has the Hurricane logo on the shoulder, which tells me that's probably a Checkers jersey because mm -hmm. they wear the Checkers logo on the front and the Hurricanes logo. Generally, the team that is their uh, parent club and a lot of these minor league teams, they wear the parent club's logo on the shoulder and then the uh, and then the, the team's main crest on the front. But mm -hmm. we, we can't see that full jersey, so we don't know for sure. It looks like the looks exactly like the old style uh, Hurricanes jersey. With the uh, with the hurricane warning flag at the bottom part of the jersey that they used to have, so but yeah, it's quite a quite a collection and reminds me of one of the YouTubers that I follow um, and I've mentioned him a couple of times on this podcast, the Hockey Guy. He's he's on YouTube. If you do do a search for the Hockey Guy on YouTube, he's got a jersey collection that he's continuing to add to. Seems like every week now he's putting out a video where he's unboxing another couple jerseys he's ordered. I don't know where he gets his money for these jerseys, but damn, <laughs> he's got uh, close to 150 jerseys in his collection, and they're all NHL jerseys, or almost all of them are NHL jerseys. Um, he just likes to collect all the various iterations of jerseys for several different... He's got like six or eight Boston Bruins jerseys. He's got several different... He's got several jerseys from every team, homes and aways, classic looks, um, mm -hmm. you know, third jerseys, you name it, he's got them. So uh, I envy folks that have collections of jerseys like this, but I, 
as much as I'd like to have a collection of jerseys like that, I don't think I'd want it because I just don't have the space for it. Agreed. <laughs> and, and, you know, you couldn't wear them all, you know? In, yeah. In, but, yeah, uh, you'd have to wear jerseys all the time yeah. if you're going to wear all those. And that includes in the summer. Right, when it's hot. Here yeah. in the south, it's you. once you get past pretty much, well, it's been warm this week, so I'd say once you get past May 1st, you don't want to be wearing hockey jerseys outside. Yeah. <laughs> until about October 1st, and then it starts cooling down enough <laughs> to, to, to wear jerseys. <laughs> so, yeah, not a fun thing to wear in the south in the summer, for sure, unless you're, unless you're indoors. All right. Well, since we're on your uh, pick of the week, why don't we go ahead and do your um, or your pick of the week? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can go ahead and get mine finished. And my, my pick of the week just talks about uh, how Tampa Bay Lightning's John Cooper is a fan of the Boston Bruins. So, um, so yeah. That actually caught my eye. I'm wanting to. I'm wanting to hear that story. So let me get mine out of the way. Yep. I had to write about this though. I had to put this down as my pick of the week, and I have featured this gentleman as a pick of the week more than once before. But this time, for the sake of his play so far in the National Hockey League uh, Stanley Cup playoffs, I had to put him down as my pick of the week again because I'm very happy for the guy. And that is Alexander Ovechkin. Ovechkin, the article I uh, have from NHL.com, Ovechkin gets first taste of Eastern Conference Final. Capitals eliminate the Penguins. Alex Ovechkin was the last player in line for the Washington Capitals, and Sidney Crosby was the first for the Pittsburgh Penguins, so it took a while for their paths to cross. Their roles were uh, reversed this time after the Capitals' 2-1 to one overtime victory in Game 6 of the Eastern Conference second round on Monday, which propelled them to the conference final for the first time in 20 years. After a handshake of respect and a friendly pat on the chest, Crosby offered his best wishes, and they each moved on. Just wish me good luck, Ovechkin said. I've been in his position lots of times. Ovechkin, 32, has waited 13 seasons for this. Three wow. times, inclu including the past two seasons, Crosby and the Penguins ended the capital season, and Ovechkin had to wish them good luck. Then he reached Pit he, re he, <coughs> he watched Pittsburgh go on to win the Stanley Cup each time. <clears throat> now, the Capitals advance to face the Tampa Bay Lightning and continue the chase for their first Stanley Cup championship. Nobody expected we were going to be in this position before this season. In this game and in this playoffs, Ovechkin said, we beat, this is his word speak, we beat the twice Stanley Cup champion, and it gives us pretty good feeling that our, about ourselves. The Penguins won nine of the previous ten Stanley Cup playoff series between the rivals, and were 9-1 and one when facing elimination against the Capitals. Washington's lone victory came in six games in the 1994 Eastern Conference quarterfinals. In the Ovechkin-Crosby era, which began when they each entered the league in 2005-06, the Capitals had gone 0 for 6 when they were within one of reaching the conference final. So when Ovechkin saw Kuznetsov finish off his breakaway and the Pittsburgh crowd went silent, his reaction was understandable. Thank God this happened, Ovechkin uh, said, and that was his first thought. We move forward, and now I can't wait for when is going to be the next game and get ready for Tampa. <laughs> just seemed no to be an over. It just seemed definitely Ovechkin speak. No matter how many goals he scored in his in the regular season, six hundred seven, or in the playoffs, fifty four, Ovechkin was always reminded that he couldn't get past the second round. Ovechkin and his 15 points in this playoff season, 15 points, eight goals, seven assists in the 12 NHL playoff games that he's played, including seven, three goals and five and four assists in six games against the Penguins. He scored the winning goal in a 4-3 victory in game three. You'll remember that goal. That was a uh, highlight reel one, if ever there was one. Yep. Then he set up Jakob Vrana's winner in the 6-3 victory in game five before setting up Kuznetsov's overtime goal Monday night. Without a doubt, he is the most valuable player uh, on the Washington Capitals. The people that are going to say something about Alex, I don't think he worries about them, Cap uh, Capitals owner Ted Leonsis said. Alex's place in history is pretty set, and now he said that he doesn't care about individual accolades. He wants the team to win. I think you saw that. You saw how hard he hustled. He threw the big pass for the win. That's a moment that says how he's arrived as a player. 
Vetchkin's comment, we believe in each other. The situation is it doesn't matter what happened. We have to stick together. It's a great feeling right now, and we're going forward. So my hat's off to Alex Ovechkin. We have talked about how the Capitals have choked in the past, but they certainly didn't do it so far in this playoffs. And I'm looking forward to this series against Tampa Bay. I'm not going to be pulling for them. So uh, I hope the Washington Capitals finally arrive on the scene and make it to the Stanley Cup Finals. Yeah, my take on the initial reaction of, of uh, you know, right after they scored the goal was – it just seemed to be overwhelming relief on the face yep. of Ovechkin that they beat the Pittsburgh Penguins. Like yep. you could tell the pressure was really on him or he was certainly putting himself through a lot of pressure. Yep, I think so. I, I think that's a perfect way to say it. And, you know, they saved the man in Barry Trotz that doesn't matter what happens now. I think he'll be back next year. Yep. I don't think there, that he has anything to worry about. That was the monkey that he had to get off his back and he did it. Yep, yep, they certainly did. All right. Well, mine was an interesting article that I found this week. Turns out that uh, Lightning head coach uh, John Cooper is a closet Boston Bruins fan, or at wow. least he was when he was growing up anyway. Probably not these days. Uh, it's an article written by Dave Stubbs for NHL.com. Uh, John Cooper cherishes his battered 1974 Bobby Orr hockey card collected when he was a boy, later signed in ballpoint pen in the mid-'80s. Uh, by the legendary Boston Bruins defenseman in Vancouver and preserved by the Tampa Bay Lightning coach since that day in a small gold frame. Uh, after Orr moved on from the Bruins, signing with the Chicago Blackhawks uh, in 1976, Cooper's affection as a fan transitioned to Ray Bork, another Hall of Fame defenseman who excelled in Boston's black and gold from 1979 to 2000. Turn the clock ahead to this week, and there was Cooper behind the Lightning bench at TD Garden in Boston, Tampa Bay defeating the Bruins 4-1 to in Game 3 of the Eastern Conference second round on Wednesday. In a suite during the game, shown on the scoreboard to roaring fans, was Bobby Orr himself with Boston Red Sox pitching icon Pedro Martinez, the latter enthusiastically waving a Bruins rally towel to whip up the crowd. And then during Game 4 on Friday, a 4-3 overtime victory, Bork was shown doing likewise with retired linebacker Teddy Bruschi, a three-time Super Bowl champion with the New England Patriots. For Cooper, who grew up a Bruins fan in Prince George, British Columbia, it obviously was business before fan worship. With two of his heroes in the building, the coach guided the Lightning to two wins on Boston ice and to within one victory of reaching the conference final. Um, and, of course, Tampa Bay did ultimately win that series four games to one uh, in, in, uh, in that series. And, of course, um, you know, the article goes on talking about uh, – uh, you know, Bruins were going to need all kinds of help from these legendary players, you know, it, for however way they can anyway. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, the, the comments on that. Um, that uh, So, yeah, he was pretty much a um, Bobby Orr and Ray Bork fan. <laughs> of course, Ray Bork was my favorite player growing up as a kid, too. So That's well, quite my, something. My favorite Bruin. I also I never picture. He just doesn't look to me like a Bruins fan, John Cooper. But, oh, especially uh, that, living that, out in British Columbia. Yeah. It must not have been. That's uh, a good Point. Not have been too popular with the, you know, obviously uh, most of his friends were probably all Canucks fans out there. Yeah. Of course, in those days, Canucks weren't really a great team to, <laughs> to root. They had an occasional <laughs> Stanley Cup uh, final run. I think they went uh, back in the 80s. They went once to the Stanley Cup final. And then uh, didn't the Rangers beat the Canucks in their Stanley Cup year, too? That's right. 1994. Yeah. And then Four the games Bru to three. And then the Bruins beat the Canucks in, in 2011. So. So yeah, the Canucks have flirted with success, but they've never won a Stanley Cup themselves. So, but he was a Bruins fan growing up. Very, very interesting. Yep. So, all right, that is all that you we have for this week. That's right. Ed, we've come to the end again. Yep. Um, but I'm looking forward to reporting next week. We'll have all four teams, and they will have completed several games in the conference finals in which they play. Yep. Uh, this is a very exciting time of the year. I can pay particular attention to the games because there's only one being played each night. Yep. And uh, I, it should be really interesting. I, the Washington Capitals, I tell you, uh, you can say what you want to about Vegas and their magical season. But to see the Washington Capitals in the in the conference finals uh, is quite something. Yep. And uh, I, I look forward to how they, that series against Tampa Bay especially. That should be really, really fun to watch. 
Yeah, clearly we have uh, one game to talk about next week in, the, in this current round. That's that game seven uh, with the uh, Preds and the uh, Jets. And after that, we'll be talking about probably games one, two, and maybe three, depending on the timing of our next podcast <coughs> of each of the conference final rounds. But here's where it gets fun. Here's where you get to see the fan frenzy in full effect, because once you reach the conference finals, that's when all the bandwagoners are all on board and... You see all kinds of events going on around the arenas, outside, inside, and all around the city. Yeah, this is a this is the best time of year, anyway. Absolutely, to uh, be a hockey fan. So, with that, we'll go ahead and end it. And uh, until next week, we will catch you then. So we'll see you next week, Steve. Have a good week, Wayne. All right, we'll see you soon. Yeah, you too. Well, there you have it. If you like the show, please show us your support by subscribing to it using your favorite podcatcher program or app. The Hockey Nuts podcast can be found on major podcast search engines like Apple Podcasts and Google Play Music. Just search for the term The Hockey Nuts in whatever app you use to get podcasts. We can also be found at thehockeywriters.com on their podcast page. Thehockeywriters.com is a great place to get more stories and content about our favorite sport. We love listener involvement, and there are a few ways you can get involved with the show. You can email the show at feedback at thehockeynuts.com. Or you can leave us a voicemail in our mailbox at 919-960-1718. You can also tweet us. I'm at WayneHalley9. Steve is at Sball504Man. Also, be sure to visit our website at thehockeynuts.com. There you can see all of our past episodes archived, and you can listen to the show through your web browser on that site. As always, links and stories that we mention in the show are available in the show notes for this episode. In addition to our website, you can also watch us record the show each week live on YouTube. We generally record on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday nights, depending on our work schedules. You can find our YouTube channel at thehockeynuts.com slash YouTube. The show is a labor of love for us, but the production of it is not free. To help us offset the cost of producing the show, we've set up various affiliate links on our webpage at thehockeynuts.com. Affiliate links allow you to help us financially support our podcast without costing you any more money out of pocket. Some of the affiliate relationships we have are with Amazon, HockeyMonkey.com, Ting.com, and SeatGeek.com. If you use any of these services, we'd greatly appreciate it if you used our affiliate link to those sites. Simply go to TheHockeyNuts.com and click on the appropriate advertising banner on the right. Your purchase will not cost you anything extra and a small portion of your purchase will come back to help support the show. Finally, we're also looking for a future guest for the show. Obviously, we're not experts on every team in league and hockey, so if you consider yourself more knowledgeable than us on a particular team or league, we definitely want to hear from you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Hockey Nuts Podcast, and have a great rest of your day.